essentially it's a combination of, of two projects. The very first one is based on, on, on a paper which we already put online, uh, so it's available for download, and this is essentially addressing the, the, the question of arbitrage opportunities in, in uh, blockchain-based markets. This is a paper which I've written together with Christoph, which was presented, and also for my, my supervisor back in Vienna, Nicolas Pauch. And I, I do my best also today to talk about some, some follow-up questions which um, which are closely related and which, which hopefully also address your point regarding market making and, and code setting in, um, in a world where the settlement is done by, a, by the blockchain. So, before you get more specific, let, let me just address why for us in academia this is a super interesting time to work on a blockchain based uh, market microstructure. Uh, why we think that there are really big differences and, and really many new things to, to discover. Um, what we are mainly concerned about is, well, if, if I think about blockchain, I, I, I personally don't care too much about cryptocurrencies, for instance. I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the technology behind it, because as, as um, also Vladimir pointed out before, so blockchain can also be used to transfer assets of any kind, right? If you think of the other coin protocol, we can also think of applications where you essentially switch to um, settlement of, of financial assets, for instance, stocks like that you also have based on a blockchain, um, and essentially switching from our traditional settlement system. I think Vladimir used exactly the same figure for this. Um, two worlds where the decentralized ledger is essentially doing the work. Um, I think right now it's, it's really very many of So what are the differences? If we think of a world where we have some intermediaries, some clearing houses, or um, some, some security deposits, which are doing all the hard work uh, which, which corresponds to the exchange of legal ownership of assets, um, this definitely has certain costs associated with it, and they are the certain drawbacks. And you often point out that it takes a long time until you essentially really settle the legal trends of ownership of, of equity trades. Um, it could be much faster or cheaper if you use a blockchain instead. Um, However, it's, it's very, very interesting points when it comes to well, how secure is something like that, and I think this is the main point where the blockchain really provides advantages. So uh, it provides a secure settlement without the need for any intermediaries. Um, as I already mentioned, legal settlement process may, may be much faster if we switch to a blockchain. Um, a really interesting thing, which I think is totally underexplored until now is that well if we really do transaction settlement on a blockchain, on a public blockchain, we have some totally new form of transparency in this market, so suddenly transactions um, become in some sense semi-transparent and we may learn much more from that. This could be good, this could also be bad depending on, on the application you think of. And there are definitely many more things. Um, which could arise if we switch from traditional settlement to a distributed ledger-based settlement um, procedure. Then all those different implications raise rather obvious economic questions, which, which all should be addressed or and all, uh, and all interesting on their own. Let me just mention the issue of market transparency, um, which may have large implications on the way we trade and the, the way markets are set up, for instance. And what we are most interested in, and what I will talk about today, is are there potential frictions which are coming across as soon as we transfer to a world where blockchain based settlement is done? And the, the friction in the financial markets is essentially an impediment to well functioning along a very well, along a certain dimension, which may lead to situations where we have some inefficient or suboptimal outcome, which is, is, is not necessarily something which is good, but it can also bring some benefits. And this is what I will talk about today. The friction I'm concerned with, as you will see in a second, is 
latency induced by settlement of this pure tension. When we started working on this project, we, we actually first had a look at the data, and first of all, we talked a lot about this data set. So we, once we started working on it, we realized there's not really much out there, although many exchanges and many trading venues are rather transparent when it comes to giving access to, to the data sets. Um, so we started by, by, by scrapping order books, and what I try to, to visualize here is the following. What you see is this is a snapshot. Those are 24 hours of Bitcoin quoted prices um, in, in, in May of in the last year. Uh, you see here on a minute level how prices, in this case we have, I'm talking about mid quotes, evolve over time. And each line corresponds to the quoted price um, at one exchange. So those are, I think during that time we had 17 different exchanges. And what you see is that, well, there are 17 different prices for one Bitcoin. So it's not the question, well, what is the price of one Bitcoin? Instead, well, here you have to ask, what is the price of one Bitcoin at this specific trading menu? And we see that they differ a lot. And as was already pointed out, this gives rise to the question, well, Shouldn't this lead to a scenario where suddenly people, which we usually call arbitrageurs, are starting to get inactive? So if you see, for instance, here, um, this, this, this line corresponding to this orange line and this red line, there's huge discrepancy. So in other words, if you would be able to buy a Bitcoin at this low price at a certain exchange and then you transfer this, um, your funds to the other exchange and sell it there as soon as possible, it looks like you should be able to make some money. And actually, this also holds if you look at the data, if you trust for issues related to liquidity, which I've just mentioned, also transaction fees. So what we see in the data is, or what we saw, especially in the past, is that there have been substantial price differences which hinted at the existence of arbitrage opportunities. And well, arbitrage in finance is something extremely fascinating because it's essentially the art of making money out of nothing, right? It suggests that you could be able to make some profits um, without having, well, without being exposed to any risk. And, and that's why we usually, finance, if you talk about efficient markets, assume that this should not really be the case. You should not really see something like that, um, such an arbitrage opportunity, because you should assume that someone should be present already, or some arbitrageurs should all, all already uh, have tried to explore this price differences. Um, so for us, the, the, the question we ask is, well, if it's really the case that no one is exploiting this price difference, then there should be a friction, something which makes it much harder for arbitrageurs to exploit such arbitrage opportunities, or to essentially to pick up this money which seems to be, well, my own thing. And we argue, or what we firstly think is that one really crucial issue which should be taken into account whenever you are interested in doing um, arbitrage trading is to think of the settlement latency. Because this is something which makes a blockchain based trading menu crucially different from well, traditional systems where we have some intermediaries. What's happening is essentially the following this is our, our main research focus is the question how does latency, so the time it takes until the transaction is, uh, the transaction is verified um, in a blockchain in the case by, by miners and therefore also added to, to a block and publicly announced to the network. Um, so this time may be long depending on the, on the application. Um, it's definitely positive, so it's, it's, there's no instantaneous settlement possible in such markets. And this is something which should be taken into consideration due to a very easy argument. Um, in a world with no intermediaries step in anymore, and this is essentially, this has been a task in traditional markets, but now in blockchains we don't have this anymore. So during settlement time, there's no one essentially guaranteeing us that, well, prices stay the same or we are not exposed to any price risk. 
and then and suddenly you're in a world where you don't have this intermediary anymore, however you still have some settlement latency. We may not talk about three days anymore, but we talk about several minutes in the, in the blockchain case. Um, well, then this essentially constitutes a certain risk. This is an additional source of uncertainty, um, which lead may to situations where you suddenly are not really faced to an arbitrage opportunity anymore, although it seems like that at the first place. So in the, the, the paper we already uploaded, but I'm also trying to give you an overview of what, what we do there. Um, we tried our best to, to identify some overlapping or some stylized facts on blockchain-based settlement. Um, whenever you use a blockchain, you perform settlement of the transactions of financial assets. Um, the associated consensus algorithm introduced something which was stochastic latency, so this is the time until verification is long. And this settlement latency implies certain limits to arbitrage, which are related to the risk I just mentioned. In other words, the time it takes until the trade is done um, exposes to you to some risk because prices may change in this time. And therefore, for arbitrage use, it could be the case that it's not attractive at all to trade. Although, well, by just looking at the data, it seems like a very profitable opportunity. Um, by looking at our data, in this case for the Bitcoin market, we argue that this is, is a really important fiction. It's large, and it's, 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 it's qualitatively um, really significant, so it matters. And, well, I try to address in the second part of my presentation some follow-up questions. Because, well, as soon as we say that all there are some limits to arbitrage in the world of blockchain-based trading, this essentially means that arbitrageurs may not be present the way we are used to, um, for instance, from equity markets. And this can sometimes be something good. So some, sometimes exchanges prefer that arbitrageurs are not present in order to exploit them. But in other situations, this is something bad when it comes to um, essentially identifying that the prices traded on exchanges are, are valid or really reflect the information. Um, so we are faced with a trade-off uh, where suddenly this uh, settlement latency um, totally changes the market microstructure. Okay. So for this presentation I decided to, to remove most of or I think of all of the equations. So instead let me let me show you a small picture of what's going on. So in the, in the easiest case, as an arbitrage sure, what you're probably doing is, is the following. You see that on two different markets, exactly the same asset is traded. Right? You can pick off um, Bitcoin trade versus US dollar. And at those two markets, the arbitrage sure observes that there is some different prices quoted. So in other words, you could buy for price um, at one market, which is below the, the price you could sell this asset. Um, at another market. This is the, the textbook arbitrage opportunity, right? And in a world where you are where, where really in a finance textbook, what you would do is you would essentially send a buy order to one market, maybe the market with the low price, then you would use transfer your asset um, to the other market such that you can sell it there, and only after this transfer and settlement is done, well, you send a sell order and you, you pocket in the gains, right? This is in the world where there's no latency. This is some riskless gain which you can pocket in immediately. There's, there's, um, there's nothing which essentially could induce some, some losses here. However, for blockchain based trading, this is a really crucial part. The transfer and the settlement of an asset to another wallet or to another exchange is something which is time consuming. For those of you who triggered a Bitcoin transaction at some point in time, you probably have already realized this. It can take some time, it can take minutes, it even can take ages depending on, on how long your transaction is queuing up in the main pool before it gets verified. And interesting thing is that well, selling it to the seller market is possible only 
if this exchange at the sell side really believes you that you have the asset you want to sell them, right? So it's only possible after settlement is done. Um, therefore, the earliest possible point in time when you're able to dispose of your position is the point after settlement is done. And during this time, well, market, the market is going on, right? It's not like everyone is waiting for you. Um, instead, people keep on trading, prices may change depending on the volatility of the, of the asset. And therefore, there may be a situation that, well, once you arrive at this market with the high price, this price may not be that high anymore after all. Thus, inducing a certain risk of making losses. Okay. Uh, and I, I go through a theoretical framework work fast, which is essentially just putting the things I try to illustrate here in some um, mathematical framework which allow us to quantify this limits of arbitrage and essentially quantify this trading decision of an arbitrage sure. It depends on the following input, so we have certain markets where we, we have those buy and, and, and sell codes for essentially the same asset. Um, for now, we, we abstract from the possibilities of short settling margin trading or the introduction of certain derivatives. This is a completely different story and discussion. And, and in our paper, we argue that this is something which also, uh, the latency should also have an effect on the pricing of such products. We can, talk, we can discuss it if you want after the presentation. And uh, we have this really important ingredient of financial markets, namely the arbitrageur. The arbitrageur is the person who monitors the codes of both markets and essentially aims at exploiting price differences the way I just described it to you. Um, the friction in the, in the, in the blockchain-based market is now the latency. The latency and the settlement is done. Um, we call it tau here. This is the waiting time until the transfer of the asset between the two markets is separate and it denotes the earliest possible time when you can dispose of your position again. Um, so at the end of the day, well, this profit of the arbitrage trading decision is then at risk if, if the sell price at this future point in time, after settlement is done, is essentially diluted by a price which you see immediately. If you then, and this is the rather standard assumption in finance assume that well, probably as an investor you really dislike uh, the, the possibility of making losses, so you're risk averse. Um, if you add this to the equation, what you get out of it is essentially a certain threshold. And this threshold, I call it D here, it tells you the following. It tells you that after adjusting for the risk associated with the settlement latency, so the risk that prices may change during this time, um, after adjusting for that, you as arbitrageur are engaging in an arbitrage trade if and only if the instantaneous profits um, fall above this limits to arbitrage, this, this boundary which I call here. This means if you observe rather small price differences right now, in this textbook world, this would be an arbitrage opportunity which you can essentially pocket in immediately. However, in a world where we are so uh, exposed to risk due to settlement latency, you may refrain from doing this. Instead, you require a certain instantaneous premium which compensates for this risk. And this is something which you will see later on is present in essentially every decentralized ledger um, technology. You always, you will always see this certain form of latency. And obviously this threshold depends on everything which defines the risk you expose to. So it's increasing with the volatility of the asset. In other words, well, the more likely it is that this asset is going up or down during the next couple of minutes, um, the, the, the less attractive it seems to you to, to engage in such a trade. If this expected latency is large, so if you have to wait long on expectation, well, then this is also something which just increases the risk you're exposed to. The same holds for the latency uncertainty. So in other words, if you don't know whether it's going to be one minute or one hour, um, 
And last but not least, it also depends on how risk averse you really are. So, how much do you weight potential losses? If you don't care about uh, making losses, but well, well, this, this doesn't matter for you at all, however, because it's a rather unreasonable assumption. So, as soon as we are um, afraid that our portfolio lose in value, this limits to our average again. Okay. So let me now take this to the data also because this has been asked already a couple of times during this, this, this winter school. Um, um, from a practical perspective, I think it's also quite interesting if I try to answer the question not is it profitable, profitable to work as an arbitrageur in, in our days Bitcoin markets, for instance. First of all, what, 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 what I personally think we need in order to answer this question is some parameterization or some quantification of the state. Um, the, the time it takes after transactions are validated. And in order to get some clue, uh, some, some idea of that, um, Christopher and I set up an additional data source, an additional database, um, which essentially corresponds to running a full Bitcoin node. So we have something like this on, on the server as well. And this Bitcoin node is something which, through which essentially all announced transactions are, uh, well, they are all coming to our node in some sense. Um, and then they are distributed to, to miners and to other nodes. Um, so we are an essential part of this Bitcoin network. And this allows us in real time, if you want, so to, to put a timestamp on every transaction once we see it the very first time. And afterwards, after let's say this transaction was verified after a couple of minutes, so it got included in the block, um, we can put a timestamp on it again in order to see how much time did it take this transaction to get verified. And this is but well, this is the latency, right? This is the time it took from announcing this transaction until it essentially got got accepted by the network, until the legal change of ownership is accomplished. And, well, as far as quite some activity in the Bitcoin network so far, and I think this number is already outdated, I think so far we've been tracked roughly probably 14 or up to 50 billion transactions which went through this, this Bitcoin network, and for each of these transactions we have this individual timestamp, which allows us to get very precise um, information on how long does it really take until the transaction is uh, validated by the network. These are some summary statistics. I think this is, this is the most interesting number here. This is the, the average time until confirmation for any transaction which went into our node until it got um, included in the block. Uh, this is well, if you take the entire last year, um, the average was roughly 18 minutes. So we are here not talking about the time it takes until the new block is mined, because there's always the opportunity that, well, you're not going to be included in the next block, and instead you should actually have to wait until it gets verified, and is then only um, included in some secret blocks afterwards. What you see in this figure here, this is for some example days, which uh, we have randomly chosen the distribution of waiting times. So you see that there's a huge mass of transactions which are validated rather fast. Um, however, there are also some outliers here, and you see that depending on some characteristics, also on some characteristics of your individual transaction, you may easily have to wait 50 or even 75 minutes until the transaction is verified. And of course, in arbitrage, it's a huge deal, right? If you don't, if you can essentially only pocket in the buy side price of your arbitrage trade, but get the sell side price only 75 minutes afterwards, prices could be anywhere, especially in the market which is as volatile as the Bitcoin market. Okay. So I skipped a bit how exactly we estimated it, but as I already said, we have this. This, this theoretical argument on how large limits to arbitrage should be in such a market, given certain rather what I think are feasible assumptions. So, based on our estimation on the duration of the latency, its uncertainty, and the current volatility in the markets. And if you plug in all those things, these are essentially this is a time series of average 
limits to arbitrage which we get. So remember, this is the number which are essentially the, the minimum required price differences before arbitrageurs could get active um, after they essentially adjusted for the risk they're exposed to. And we see that these numbers are, are, are actually quite a lot. So they are important basis points and we are talking on average about roughly 124 basis points. Which means that well, you would only exploit a charge opportunity if you're risk averse and if you're aware of the fact that your transaction may take some time. If the instantaneous price differences exceed this threshold of, let's say, on average, 124 basis point. And from the figure I showed you on the, on the second slide with the, with the high frequency snapshots of mid, uh, mid core data, uh, what you essentially could see is that almost none of the observed price differences there would exceed this threshold. So, in other words, although we see that there are many different prices, even without adjusting for transaction costs, this is something which comes on top. Um, we'd argue that there is not really, so at least in this case, some, some, some feasible arbitrage opportunity after adjusting for the associated risk. A really, really important and, and very crucial factor is the following. At least in my understanding, or how, how I interpret it, the security in a distributed ledger technology is, is in some sense bought by time, right? But what, what's usually done is, well, an exchange does not accept your transaction just because it got included in a block once. Instead, they, with the argument of well, reducing the probability of some double spending attack, they require your transaction to be included in a block, um, which is already part of a longer blockchain, and some subsequent blocks have already been mined. And this is obviously very time consuming, right? You can increase this numbers of uh, this number of required blocks before the exchange um, regards your transaction is being validated. Um, you can increase it arbitrarily. Uh, however, this also increases the time until the clients of this exchange essentially can access their um, their deposits, right? And in the case of the arbitrageurs, this is making it much more costly for them. Um, Cases where security is, is higher, or the security requirements are higher, so that a higher number of confirmations is required. And I think nowadays most Bitcoin based platforms require five or six uh, blocks. This increases the arbitrage boundary considerably. So if we talk about five or six, we talk about an increase of, of, of well, I think, 15, 16 percent compared to essentially neglecting the risk of the double spending attack. So you always have this trade-off between how secure is the transaction or how risky is it for the exchange and, and how attractive is it for arbitrageurs to act on this certain exchange. And now to answer the question, um, is it profitable, profitable to do arbitrage? Um, or maybe not to answer it, but at least to, to hint in this direction. Um, what you see here, this is an, is an aggregate figure, so it's, it's not based on specific exchange pairs, but it's, it's based on all the exchanges we collected. So again, Christoph and I, we collected this data on 17 different exchanges, so we have, so we, well, hypothetically, we have 17 times 16 different values of, of doing arbitrage opportunity. Uh, opportunities. And what we do is we compare the observed price differences after adjusting for fees, as corresponds to this red line, um, with our derived or estimated limits to arbitrage. And the interesting question is, of course, do the observed price differences exceed these limits to arbitrage? Because this is what essentially resembles a, a real arbitrage opportunity after adjusting for the latency risk associated with it. And, and what you see is that, well, essentially since last year, and I think the numbers are going on like this, after adjusting for latency risk and after adjusting for transaction costs, price differences we observe 
essentially almost always fall inside these limits of arbitrage, which means that, well, if you are not risk neutral, um, it should be rather hard to, to really exploit, exploit something like that um, in a profitable way after adjusting for the risk. But of course, this is just an average, which is an shipping spec. There can always be some short lived um, uh, price differences which even exceed our uh, estimated limits. However, this is something we should definitely be taking account. This is a real risk for arbitrageurs, the time that it's happening. Okay. This was, in a nutshell, what, what we did in the, in the paper at hand. And let me now give you some, some ideas on, on how, how to proceed, or what can we make out of this information. I mean, obviously, one, one takeaway is now the well, arbitrage should be concerned. Whenever blockchain based trading is done, irrespective of whether we are talking about cryptos or about equities based on some other coins, for instance, you're exposed to this source of risk, which at this point does not really exist in my opinion, in equity-based markets or in traditional markets. So, arbitrageurs may essentially refrain from trading and they may reduce their trading activities up to a certain threshold, right? And for me, as a, as a researcher, it's a really interesting question that you ask, well, what is the implication of that? Is this good or is it bad? Do we want to have protection against arbitrageurs or not? And um, to at least partially address this question, uh, let me give you some arguments on why arbitrage may be important uh, for financial markets. First of all, and this is, I think, the core role of any arbitrage, usually you see arbitrage as the ones who, who make sure the prices that exchange are informative. So the, the traded prices, if they, if they are not aligned, across different exchanges, this essentially means something, something's probably wrong. Because if one exchange takes it, it's as it is extremely expensive, and the other exchange is essentially giving it away for free, and no one's trading on it, um, this means those different prices could persist, and no one really knows, well, what is now the value of this asset? Is it really worthless, or is it worth a lot? So this is a really crucial component of the functioning of financial markets, if you don't have arbitrageurs, we may lose with respect to this um, dimension and the, the information we, we collect on an everyday basis may not really be embedded in prices after all. Another little bit more theoretical question is, oh, if you think of adding certain derivatives on, on traded prices of an exchange, um, Mathematically speaking, this gets complicated as soon as there's not a thing such as the law of price. So if you if you cannot really answer the question, what is for instance, what is the price of one Bitcoin? But instead it depends on certain different exchanges and, and you can never really say um, or really specify what the price is, then it's also much harder to say something about the appropriate pricing of derivatives based on on some, some blockchain-based settlement uh, procedure. And of course, this also hints at the question of what are the implied costs of switching to um, a blockchain-based settlement system? So switching from some traditional settlement system to a settlement uh, which is done by a blockchain. Um, this definitely <coughs> depends on the application. I've already told you about these limits depend on the volatility of the asset. So, for instance, if the volatility of the underlying asset is, is rather small compared to the latency you are faced to, then these, these, these limits of arbitrage get much smaller. However, in other cases, for instance, for equities, the picture may look completely different. If you think of equity, well, quite often you are um, talking about high frequency traders, right? Those are the people that are very tiny. But timing really matters a lot. And uh, I just told me that I'm essentially already running out of time. 
Um, so I should make a high frequency presentation now, but I essentially just summarize a little bit what, what I wanted to, to tell you in the end. Um, a really big really point is that well, satellite latency slows down the speed of high frequency traders, which may be crucial components of financial markets. And as soon as we adjust for that, so as soon as we allow all market participants to realize that, so for instance also market makers, which may realize that well, the arbitrage shares, which may rip us off or essentially trade against us at, at, at prices which are suboptimal for us, um, then also folks should adjust. And I'm, I'm skipping over all my theory now and I just give you one very final thing on that. Um, this is essentially something I'm currently working on, so um, any, any comment here is really appreciated. What I argue is the following. If in a world um, with a blockchain-based settlement, so when we have latency, arbitrage shares are slowed down, this, is, this can be something good for market makers, because usually market makers are the ones who set a spread, which is so, uh, which is large enough in order to compensate for the risks of trading against informed traders or arbitrageurs in some sense. In other words, if we know that those arbitrageurs are slowed down, this is something exchanges could use in order to narrow down their spreads in a certain way. And the outcome would be a market where spreads are much lower, which also addresses what Christoph said before. So this, uh, this is in some sense, it seems much more attractive for investors to trade at such an exchange. You can quote or post much more liquidity due to this risk of absent arbitrage shares. But on the other hand side, price informativeness or the, the movement of funds between different markets due to some information flow may be reduced as well, such that you essentially cannot learn that much anymore from prices quoted at different exchanges. I think I already have to conclude. It's just really fast now. Um, okay. so, so the main takeaway from this presentation is hopefully for you that well, we argue that the settlement latency is a really fundamental technological friction which really matters economically, which is also large quantitatively if you, if you estimate it, but which also affects every decentralized ledger, not only Bitcoin-based trading. Um, for, for the Bitcoin market, we find that those limits of arbitrage are huge, um, and we, we also think that there's not much space left for arbitrage to really work profitable. And, well, the outlook is essentially that I personally think there could be much more done also for liquidity providers, such as the market maker of Luke, in order to essentially trust for this latency, because this gives you an indication of, of arbitrage um, activity at a certain point in time. But well, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention.